Corinne Larinaga, and she'll introduce her book. Uh, But then I get really excited and I'm like, hang on, sit down because I'm going to tell you all about the Basque Country and why you should go there and why the food is the best and why we just are all around amazing people. So, um, so yes, I am Corinne Laranaga. Uh, I am an author and I recently published a small collection of short stories called Galsagoriac and Other Creatures and I'm really excited to be here today to talk about it. Um, I am from Salt Lake City, Utah. My grandparents immigrated from Spain and um, my grandfather came in the mid-30s and my grandmother followed in the 50s um, and they brought their culture with them and brought that into the Basque Club of Utah and I grew up in that club um, dancing and well until I got you know too clumsy to dance um, but you know being Basque has always been a really important part of my identity so much so that when I got married, um, I actually kept my maiden name because I just couldn't give that up. I loved the fact that every time that I go anywhere, every time I sign my name, every time one of my books is on display somewhere, that's a little piece of being Basque. And I love the fact that, that it's so easy to recognize someone. Like, they walk up and they're like, oh, my name is Austin Mendy. And I'm like, oh yeah, you're Basque, I'm Basque, we're all Basque, we all know what the words mean. So, <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. The clicker doesn't appear to be clicking. Oh, oh it's not on. So, sorry. There we go. Okay. So real quick, um, just a little bit about me. Like I said, I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm an author. I primarily write mystery and horror and a little bit of fantasy. Um, and so I love folk tales because, as Mia mentioned, they get a little bit gruesome. Um, they're <laughs> cautionary tales. There's fantastic beasts. There's always a lesson hidden inside the horror of it, though. Like, it's terrible, and terrible things are happening because they're trying to get a point across that you shouldn't venture out in the wilds at night when it's dangerous, and you should be honest in your dealings. And these um, monsters help guide our children to uh, be raised to live rightly. And so we use these scary monsters to get that point across. Um, so... When I was growing up, though, I didn't really have a lot of Basque influence in what I was reading. Um, like many other American children, the books that I was reading were heavily influenced by other parts of Europe. So Aesop's Fables, coming from Greece, um, Grimm's Fairy Tales, which the, I do prefer the kind of <coughs> gruesome or grim versions. <laughs> I was just chatting with. Uh, someone earlier about uh, the Disneyfied versions that we grew up with, but those came from Germany. Um, even Mother Goose's fairy tales and a lot of the the roots of a lot of Disney movies they came from um, Charles Perrault, uh, who was French. So there was definitely some familiarity with um, those European roots, but there wasn't ever anything when I was growing up that was specifically Basque. None of my storybooks had Basque names in them. Um, none of them had images from the Basque country where my family was from. And I definitely, you know, I feel like that's a bummer. <laughs> so, um, so I've been fortunate enough um, in my adult life to be published and um, to have kind of a platform that I can speak from now and that I can tr kind of try to influence the world a little bit to be the way that I'd like it to be. And so one of the things that I'm trying to use that platform to do is spread awareness of Basque culture so that maybe I can have fewer of those conversations where someone looks completely dumbfounded when you mention that you're Basque or like you mentioned, mistakes it for a fish, so, <laughs> which is a real thing that happens. Um, so once I realized that I had uh, this opportunity to spread Basque culture, I was inspired to um, create that book that I wished had existed when I was younger, that collection of uh, folk tales that is designed for children, and I left in a little bit of the cautionary tale and a little bit of the, the not-so-happy endings. Um, and earlier this year, oh, I'm getting totally ahead of myself. Let me go back. So I'm going to go all the way back to 1993, um, which was the first time that I was ever lucky enough to actually travel to the Basque Country. My family is from Guernica. Um, most of them still live in Fordowa, and we try, my husband and I, we try to go back and visit every 
two years if we're lucky, four if we're not. And going back in March, it will have been over five years, and at this point I'm practically itchy with homesickness uh, for Guernica because I want to be there. So, um, But when, so when I was a child, when I was nine years old, my parents took us to the Basque Country for the first time so that we could meet our extended family and see where my grandparents had come from and make that connection to our cultural heritage. Um, we went at Christmas time, which is fantastic. Can't recommend it enough. There's no one else there. You get all the all, all the castles to yourself. You can run around like mad. Uh, but as a kid, there was one thing that I was actually a little bit disappointed in at first, and that was the Christmas parade because my mother told me that Santa would be there, and Santa was not there. <laughs> Someone better was. Olancero was there in his donkey pulled cart, throwing out presents with his wife. Everyone was singing songs. The Christmas Eve parade in Guernica just blew my mind. Like what started as disappointment because my American version of Santa wasn't there turned into this wonderful moment of awe that there was this Basque culture, this Basque story that I had never heard of before. And so all the way back then, the seed was planted that um, that I wanted to learn more about my cultural heritage and about those stories that I had never heard before. I didn't have the Basque grandmother that told me the stories. My Basque grandmother taught me to cook, which is amazing, but no stories to go along with that. Um, so Olin Sarah was kind of that first little seed um, that eventually, some 20 some odd years later, grew into Galsagoriak and other creatures, which is um, a collection of stories inspired by Basque folklore. Um, I didn't really want to rewrite the stories that already existed. What I wanted to do was start with the seedling from those original folk tales and kind of put my own spin on it um, and broaden it a little bit for an American audience um, so that hopefully children can read these stories and adults can read these stories um, and learn about Basque culture, the Basque language, Basque food. I kind of tried to shoehorn in as many references to um, the language and food as I possibly could. But what I'd like to talk to you about today um, is the, the roots of those stories and uh, what they grew into a little bit. So before I dive into the words themselves, um, these stories were illustrated by a, a young lady named Karina Barajas. Um, if you're familiar with Gene Flesher, he has a band called Americanwork. Um, and uh, Karina is his niece, and she's very talented, and I loved working with her um, because she's Basque as well. It was really exciting to, um, we, we both kind of got to take a journey together, you know, and dive into these stories and bring them to life, so. Um, as we've kind of been exploring a little bit throughout the presentations today, um, Basque mythology is fairly broad. Um, there's the goddesses, like Mary, there's the lords of the forest, and then there's the mischievous little creatures. And I definitely resonated more with the mischievous creatures, the people that cause a little bit of havoc, and the people that teach us, force us, rather, to learn those lessons. Um, so I definitely prefer the monsters. Maybe it's that horror background, just singing through everything that I do. Um, the first story that really I got attached to, the very first one that I started writing when I started down the road on this project, was the Galtzegoriak. Is anybody already familiar with this folk tale? Perfect. So they are mischievous little imps um, that will do chores for you. Um, so if you, like the character in my story, have, say, neglected your farm because you've been chasing after a young lady and want to get her hand in marriage, and now her dad is coming to check out your farm and make sure you're a good prospect for her, his daughter, you might panic and think, oh my gosh, there's like tons of fences to repair and my barn is ruined. So you might go to a certain bar and talk to a certain gentleman and get a box of Galtzegoriak, which you can bring home and give them a task. For instance, you can tell them to repair your fence and to till your fields and milk the cows and uh, they'll do anything that you tell them. Um, but you gotta keep them busy because they are mischievous and if they aren't busy, then they will get into trouble and they'll make trouble for you. So I loved this story. Um, it's definitely not one that I had heard as a child. Again, my family was from Guernica and all of my research into the Basque folklore 
um, put the Galsigoriac story originating, or at least usually mentioning, areas in Lepurdi. So most of the stories I found specifically mentioned like Bayonne. Um, but uh, I don't know, I love little like impish, mischievous guys. And Karina really brought them to life and pulled in so much basqueness for me because uh, she put them in the little chapellas and um, uh, they just look really basque. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, and even the noses. I mean, <laughs> she really nailed it. And that's, that's something else that's making me laugh a little bit today, too, because I'm used to um, all of my vast community in Salt Lake City, Utah. It's a pretty tight-knit group. And I'm laughing a little bit today because I'm all the way in San Francisco and so many facial features. It's like we all totally look related. So. <laughs> Um, this one uh, is kind of a lord of the night. His name is Gaueco. Gaueco is the classic cautionary figure. So if you are doing something that you really shouldn't be doing, it's a bad idea, and especially it's taking place at night, Gaueco is going to try to warn you away from doing that. Um, I've read tales of varying severity where maybe Gaueco might just give the traveler a warning to go home and that's it. Like, hey, don't travel down this road, it's dangerous, but what happens next is on you. And I've read some other versions where Gaueco actually takes some more direct hand in making sure that if that warning is ignored, that you are going to pay the price. And I prefer that second version, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> So I found references to Gao Echo from pretty much every province. So it definitely seemed kind of universal to the Basque country as a whole. Um, I couldn't really trace it or nail it down to one particular area. Um, and so for my version, I follow a pair of brothers who are walking the Camino de Santiago, um, taking the northern road through um, the Basque country in memory of their grandfather, their Aitona, who recently passed away. Um, their Aitona had walked the Camino de Santiago in his youth, and it had been a major formative period for him. So on his deathbed, he made them swear that they would walk the exact same path. But they're falling behind a little bit. They're behind in schedule because one of the brothers, Dooney, can't stop drinking long enough to actually make good progress. So the older brother, Marco, is forced to kind of haul him along at night, and they encounter Gaueco, who's warning them that traveling at night along the road might not be such a good idea. Um, and, yeah, they get into some trouble, so. And as we heard earlier from uh, Miren, we heard a little bit about the Laminek. And as Mia touched on, there's all of these different spellings, different pronunciations for what boils down to being essentially the same creature. And it's kind of like how um, I recently started taking Uskera Batua lessons, um, Unified Basque. And I was so excited to talk to my grandma in Basque and to speak to her. And I, I went to her house and I started saying stuff and she was, she's like, no, that doesn't mean anything to me, no, that. <laughs> and I'm like, am I pronouncing it badly? So I wrote it down and she's like, I don't know, like 50% of that is the Basque that I speak. Um, so I think it's kind of like that, that and that's the reason that Uskera Batua was created in the first place is because there's so many different versions of the language. So, uh, so not to get completely off track, but that's why you might see Lamiak um, or Laminek, but they're both kind of the same thing. They're kind of these water nymphs. So uh, I love her duck feet um, because essentially she's human, except for this one telltale trait. And in the mythology, um, which mostly I found from Gipuzkoa, La Purdi and Nafaroa. Um, most of it talks about how they're the builders and they um, you know, built a lot of the bridges in the areas. There's lots of um, bridges and rivers and roads that are named for them. Um, but I found some other stories as well that kind of painted them as uh, not quite gold diggers, but definitely kind of like man hunters. So uh, they would trip farm boys into marrying them so that they could, I don't know, get out of this life of constantly having to build bridges all the time. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of explore this in a sort of Cinderella story, um, where this young Lamia named Isar 
is very, very bored with being a Lamia. She doesn't want to build any more bridges. She doesn't want to till any more fields. She feels like there's something bigger out there in the world, and she wants to be a part of it. Um, and so she uh, gets an opportunity to do that at one of the festivals. Meets a boy, falls in love, all that good stuff. Um, so it's, I call it my Basque Cinderella story, because it's about wondering if there's something more to your life and actually getting to explore that, which is something that I've been very fortunate to be able to do. Uh, this one, there's a beautiful illustration over there that Mia did of Eren Suge. Um, this is the classic Basque dragon. So the, uh, there's all of these wonderful classic tales of dragon slayers and maidens going missing and um, danger and flocks being destroyed by these fire-breathing monsters. And one of the classic traits of them uh, is that they do have seven heads, which as you know, there are seven provinces in the Basque country. And I love how many times in the folklore the number seven comes up. It's such a powerful number. Um, so my story follows uh, kind of a con artist who's after a purse of money that's been promised if the Eden Suge can be, can be destroyed. So he gets mixed up in kind of a band of adventurers who are going to go and destroy the dragon, but he has no plans to follow through on that. He just wants to take the money and run. And the last story in my collection is another one that there's references to throughout the Basque country. And I saved my favorite for last. I'm kind of, um, kind of a fool for witches. Anything witch-related gets me super excited. I love magic. Um, I did the whole, when I was younger, thing of like creating spells in my backyard and trying to make stuff. <laughs> I don't know. I've been pretty lucky. Maybe they worked. Uh, but the other thing that I'm kind of a fool for are cats. My husband and I foster uh, cats back in Utah. Um, we're involved in an animal rescue, and like, if you want to totally diffuse my anger, show me a picture of a kitten, and I, it just works every time. Um, so in Basque mythology, the witches were often said to be the servants of the goddess Mary. Um, but I've also read other things that say that they were kind of troublemakers and would prey on pious women and try to extort money from them. They would make trouble by uh, destroying crops and... So there's definitely two sides of the coin there. Some say that they're benevolent and use their magic for good, and others use magic the way that I would probably use magic if I was bored. Um, but one of the hallmarks of the Basque witches, or the Sorginac, um, is that they can turn into and take the form of cats. And I'm like, that's my two favorite things in the world combined right there. <laughs> um, so my uh, story follows three sisters who are, they're witches, but it's the slow season. The Camino de Santiago doesn't really have anyone on it in the winter so much, um, so they don't really have anyone to harass that isn't already aware of them. Um, so one night that they're particularly bored, a handsome cat strolls into their house and challenges them to some games and some bets to keep themselves entertained. So they get mixed up with uh, another witch who um, refuses to come out of his cat form until the game is over. Um, all of these stories came from different places in the Basque country. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that I really wanted to do was introduce an American audience to these stories. Um, so kind of to exercise my artistic license and serve the narrative a little bit, I pulled all of those stories and put them in one location. They interconnect a little bit, um, and the location that I chose for that is Gromica for a couple of reasons. Um, the primary one being, um, I'm sure that anyone who's visited Gernica visited the Basque Meeting House um, with the seven stone chairs and the tree of Gernica where the leaders of the community would come together to make important decisions and guide the nation. And so I thought it was appropriate to pull together these Basque folk tales from you know, all over the country and put them in one place. And in addition, I love Guernica. <laughs> like if I could buy an apartment anywhere in Europe, it would be Guernica. Um, it is such a, it just feels magical to me. As soon as I step out onto the streets, I, I really feel like I'm part of something so much older, which in America, there's some beautiful natural places, some places that the Native Americans built that have that type of storied history. But apart from that, everything here is so new. So anyway. 
Um, so that's the book. It's a collection of folk tales. Um, it is available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I have hardbacks here, and I'm really excited because uh, just a few weeks ago, it also became available as an audiobook. And the narrator, um, I coached him on how to pronounce what few Basque words I actually know. Um, and at the end of every chapter, he translates those a little bit. So I'm really hoping that this story can kind of help spread Basque cultural awareness, um, get people excited about Basque culture and the Basque country, maybe travel there, take some of their tourist dollars, um, and, and just kind of spread awareness of our wonderful culture as a whole. And also so that other little girls like me that are growing up and reading Grimm's fairy tales um, can read something that connects to their cultural heritage at the same time. what stories to use in this book? That was tricky, because um, there's so many amazing tales, like Basque Juan is such a great story, and um, I, I love the mischievous fox. I ended up using the fox in one of my novels as a last name for a mischievous character, just to kind of sneak it in somewhere else. Um, so really, um, I just the ones that I kept going back to, like the stories of Galtzegori, like the ones that just really seemed to grab a hold of me, um, those were the ones that I tried to write. But in the end, it, it just ended up being the stories that came out good. <laughs> so there's some that didn't make it in that, that hopefully I'd like to do another collection that focuses more on um, the deities and the creation myths and things like that. And so maybe some of those will find a home there. How do you need the uh, Orenchero House in Munguia so you can Resort tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I have not. I'm going to the Basque Country in March. You said it's in Munguia? Munguia. Oh, okay. Olenchero House is there. They, they rebuild an old farmhouse that is like 600 years old, so they just do a lot of stuff there. So that would be a good research. The mail will be also a good one for Lamina. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I'm so excited. It's been way too long since I've been able to travel back there. So I call it being homesick, even though I'm from Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> it's my true home. All right, cool. Well, I'll be over there when it's all over. Please come by, say hi. I'd love to chat more about it. Oh, oh, oh. you mentioned that. Um Gasagoria are available in bars, depending on the person that you know. <laughs> can you name the bar and the person? Uh, they're all, all commenting about a lot of things that can be done in our respective homes, and we can't find anybody to do it. I don't know if you want to open that box. I think I'm doing you a favor by keeping my source a secret, because... Should we check with Jean, though? Because I yeah, think Jean, Jean might, might know the bar. Jean might know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.